welcome to this talk about Bayesian inference. It's about um, the fundamentals of how we find out stuff from data. So this is uh, sort of a very high level or low level talk. Um, however you orientate yourself, it's basically about the mathematics of logical reasoning about uncertain quantities which we do when we analyze neuroimaging data. So I will share my slides here. And we will first look at the kinds of questions that we want to answer using data, not just in neuroimaging, but um, in science in general. So a few years ago, there was this article with a question, does chocolate make you clever? Eating more cho chocolate improves the nation's chances of producing Nobel Prize winners, or at least that's what a recent study appears to suggest. How much chocolate do Nobel laureates eat and how could any such link be explained? Well, that's certainly an interesting finding, isn't it? But um, it would take a lot of evidence to convince us of something like that. Well, let's see what the evidence is. The study that the article references was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious journals in all of medicine. And um, that already indicates um, a strong and interesting finding. And here are the data graphically. On the horizontal axis, you have chocolate consumption in kilograms per year per capita for different nations. So the further on the right, a nation's flag is the more the people in that nation eat chocolate. And then on the vertical axis, we have Nobel laureates per 10 million population. And we see a very strong correlation. So uh, the actual correlation is 0.791, about 0.8. And the p-value associated with that correlation is impressively low, 0.0001. And um, you can see various interesting phenomena, but the, the main thing that you can see is the more chocolate is eaten in a nation, the more Nobel Prize winners they have per 10 million population. Now, how could we reason about such a relationship and um, investigate possible um, connections between these two variables, which are both uncertain? We need a mathematical tool to do that, and the math mathematical tool will be Bayesian inference, and we'll return to this example. The first thing we want to um, understand is what question are we actually trying to answer? So I wrote here, so will I win the Nobel Prize if I eat lots of chocolate? That's not very well defined yet. We have to refine this a bit, and. Um, perhaps a sensible question to ask would be how does the amount of chocolate I eat affect the probability that I will win a Nobel Prize and that is now a so-called conditional probability so in mathematical notation that would be the probability of winning a Nobel Prize given here I say lots of chocolate or given just a certain amount of chocolate so I'm, I want to know the probability um, winning a Nobel Prize if I eat 10 grams a day, if I eat 20 grams a day, if I eat a kilo a day, and so on. So this is a conditional probability. We need to know how we operate on these conditional probabilities, how we calculate them, how we manipulate them mathematically. And for that, we need Bayesian inference. So how do we calculate with probabilities. One way to introduce this, it's not the only way, but it's, um, yeah, one way to do it is to look at different sets. So we have 
a set of possible observations, and we're going to call that omega. And within that probability space omega, we have a subset A and we have a subset B, and they overlap to a certain degree. Now, to understand the rules of probability, unfortunately, there are only three rules of probability. We need to understand three kinds of probability. And those are marginal probabilities, like the probability of A. That is just the probability that an event in omega as a whole is also in A. Joint probabilities, the probability that an event, an observation in omega is at the same time in A and in B. And we use the notation A comma B for that. And conditional probabilities. That means, given that we already know that an observation is in A, is an observation of kind A, what is the probability now that it is also a, an observation, an event of kind B? So we look at marginal probabilities. That is basically everything covered by A. Are we in A or are we not in A? That is the only question here. Joint probabilities, we need to look at the overlap of A and B. So are we in A and in B at the same time? Now, what is marginal about marginal probabilities? We can illustrate this with an example. So let A be the statement, the sun is shining, and B be the statement, it is rainy. Not A with a little bar above, so A bar negates A, B bar negates B. Now, let's consider the following table of joint probabilities. And uh, if you ever get confused about probabilities, um, Go back to these slides and meditate a little over this table here. Um, basically, all or much about probabilities um, can be understood from staring at tables like this one long enough. So we have a table for A and not A on the vertical dimension, and B and not B on the horizontal dimension. And then we have all the possible combinations of A and not A and B and not B in these fields in the table. And we assign probabilities to all of the possible combinations. So we, here we have the probability for A and B, the joint probability of A and B, that's 0.1. Then here we have another joint probability, that's the joint probability of A and not B, that's 0.5. And let's see if this makes sense. So A is the sun is shining, and B is it's raining. And there's a pretty low probability, not zero, but a pretty low probability of that happening at the same time. So it makes sense to have 0.1 here. And then the sun is shining, and it is not raining. That's about half. That also makes sense. Then we have not A and B, 0.2, and not A and not B, 0.2. And one thing we notice is that, of course, one of them has to be true. So they need to sum up to one. So the sum of all probabilities is one. All of them in the table here together have to be one. And now we can do different sums across the rows and across the columns here. So if we want to know the probability of A, only the probability that the sun is shining, we have to add up the probability that the sun is shining while it's raining and while it's not raining. So we take the sun across this row. We want to know the total probability for the sun is not shining. We ha also have to sum up over it's raining and it's not raining. And these probabilities stand at the margin of the table, and that's why they're called marginal probabilities. 
And again, if we sum up first across the rows and then down the column at the margin, we need to sum up to one. So 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4 is one. Now the same for the marginal probabilities down here. I think you've understood how this game goes. So the marginal probabilities get their name from being at the margin of the table such as this one. There's nothing more mysterious about that. Now conditional probability. In the example, what is the probability that the sun is shining given that it is not raining? So now we're saying we know it's not raining. But how does that affect the probability that the sun is shining? So we have to do um, a bit more thinking on that. So this can be written as the conditional probability of A given not B. So you can find the answer to the question by asking yourself, out of all times where it is not raining, which proportion of times will the sun be shining? And now it's over to you. What's the answer? I'll give you um, a minute or a little more than a minute. And then if um, any of you has the, the guts to venture an answer, I'll be listening. I see in the chat there are two questions. Let me see. Um, there's one person saying, I think there is a problem with the cursor position. I'm sorry about that. Um, oops, I've revealed the answer. Let me go back here. Yeah. Um, now, can you see my mouse like this? No. I can see it. You can see it. So, so I'm at, um, here on the margin at P of not A is 0 0.4. Is that, does that work for you? Okay. Good. It's a call. Okay. Good. I, I couldn't understand everything that was said, um, but um, I, we have one answer in the chat. Is it just 0 0.5? And then probably the cursor position is only a problem for some of you. Um, no, the answer is it, it, it's not 0 0.5. Um, so anyone want to... So the cursor position is shifted. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Good. Other answers? Otherwise, we'll go straight to the reveal. We have to divide the joint probability of the sun shining, not raining, by the sum of all joint probabilities where it is not raining. So that is the conditional probability. The sun is shining given that it is not raining. So the one thing we're interested in, sun shining but not raining, has to be divided through all the probabilities where it's not raining. So what is the proportion of times that the sun is shining why it's not raining, compared to all the cases in which the sun, um, the, where it's not raining. And that turns out to be, you can look at the table there, that turns out to be 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.7, so 0 0.71. Now, here we went and actually thought about this in the sat at the table and so on, but we want to have this kind of question answered in an almost automatic way. So we want an equation for this, or a set of equations. And that, those are the rules of probability. So we need probabilities to add up to one. We saw that in the um, table there. Then we saw marginalization. So if we want 
the probability of B alone, we have to sum up the joint probabilities of B over all the possible values of A. And then conditioning, we have the problem product rule. And this, you can also find this by um, thinking a little about the previous slide, but it turns out to be that the um, joint probability of A and B is the conditional probability of A given B times the marginal probability of B, or the other way around. The joint probability of A and B is also the conditional probability of B given A times the marginal probability of A. So these are axioms. They're assumed to be true. They make sense. They work. Therefore, we cannot test them the way we would test the theory. However, we can see if they turn out to be useful. They've been around for um, almost 100 years and uh, as axioms, and they've been in use for at least 200 years. Um, so they have proven themselves useful. Another way to the rules of probability is to show that they make sense in being derivable from three basic desiderata. So there are three things that if you admit them, you also have to admit the rules of probability. I'll just quickly mention these without going into this much further. But it's an interesting um, intellectual exercise here. So if you admit that the that you can represent the degrees of plausibility of a statement by a real number. And if you admit that there is, should be a qualitative correspondence with common sense in a mathematically well-defined sense, and if you want consistency. So if there are two ways to calculate the same thing, they have to give you the same result. So if you um, insist on these three conditions being fulfilled, then you also bind yourself to the rules of probability. So there is no way um, to violate the rules of probability if you admit these three desiderata. Now, going back to conditional probabilities, the definition of the joint probability um, via conditional probabilities, we can take this equation of doing it the two ways around conditional probability of a given b times marginal of b equals conditional probability of b given a times marginal of a and divide by the probability of b and there we go we have bayes rule and this the equation is the reason why we call this bayesian inference so the conditional probability of a and b can be written in the way you see on the screen. And then in the second equality, we unpack the marginal probability of B by summing up over the possible values of A again. So we use marginalization here and the product rule at the same time. And this is explained down here. So this is Bayes' rule. And now, why is Bayes' rule so extremely useful? It allows us to invert conditional probabilities. So if we know the conditional probability of B given A, we can go via Bayes' rule to the other, the inverted conditional probability of A given B. So here we have the two, conditional probability of B given A, but what we're really interested in is conditional probability of A given B. In other words, this allows us to update our belief about A in light of observation B. So if we have a certain belief about A, and the mathematically rigorous way to define belief is a probability distribution. So our belief about A is represented by this probability distribution over A. And now we make an observation B and we want to know how does this observation B affect our belief about A. And the mathematical way to formulate this is that we now have a 
probability distribution of A given our observation B. So what is the probability of A given B? Well, Bayes' theorem tells us that. Bayes' theorem tells us that we need to take our old belief about A before we knew the observation B and multiply this by the conditional probability of the observation B given A divided by the marginal probability of B. And this is all very abstract, but it'll become very concrete immediately by looking at our Nobel Prize in chocolate ex um, example. So it's immediately clear that the probability of giving of winning a Nobel Prize, given that we eat a certain amount of chocolate, is very different from the probability of eating a certain amount of chocolate, given that we have a Nobel Prize. Um, but this is sometimes a pitfall. People often don't distinguish um, these two different conditional probabilities. But here I think it's, it's immediately obvious. Now, the crucial thing here is the first one is the one we're interested in. We want to um, find out how does it, how is the probability of winning a Nobel Prize is affected by eating um, different amounts of chocolate. But we cannot determine this directly. Imagine doing a study investigating this. You would have to take a huge number of people, perhaps even hundreds of millions of people, and assign them to different chocolate eating conditions. You would have to say, OK, you are in a group that eats one gram of chocolate a day. You are in a group that eats five grams of chocolate a day, 100 grams, and so on. And then you would have to observe these people over decades and see in which category how many people win Nobel Prizes. And that would be an extremely rare occurrence. So you would have to run this experiment for decades, perhaps centuries, perhaps a millennium, until you would have a good idea of what the conditional probability of winning a Nobel Prize given eating a certain amount of chocolate is. However, the other conditional probability, the conditional probability of eating a certain amount of chocolate, given that a person has a Nobel Prize, is much easier to determine. You can go into a survey of Nobel Prize winners and ask them, how much chocolate do you eat? And then you get an idea of how much, uh, what the distribution of chocolate eating is among Nobel Prize winners. So that you can determine. And now the magic of Bayes' theorem allows you to determine the conditional probability that you had no way of getting at directly, indirectly. So what you can do is you can determine what we call the likelihood by doing a survey of Nobel Prize winners. You can determine the prior probability of winning or of having a Nobel Prize if you just randomly grab a person off the street, what's the probability of there being a Nobel laureate? Well, you can determine that by looking at how many Nobel laureates there are still living uh, and dividing that by uh, the number of people on Earth. So that gives you the prior probability of randomly finding a Nobel laureate. That's easy to determine. And then the third thing you need to determine, that is, the general distribution of chocolate eating in the population. And I'm certain the chocolate industry has numbers on that. They know how many people eat how much in the general population. So it would be some work to find that out, but it's not impossible. That means all the quantities on the right-hand side of this equation can be determined. The quantity on the left-hand side which cannot be determined directly, but which unfortunately is our quantity of interest, can be calculated now by using the quantities on the right-hand side. And that is the power of Bayesian inference. And that is why it's ubiquitous, um, often in an explicit sense, but sometimes also in an implicit sense in all of science, because every measurement we make is uncertain. All the quantities we reason about are uncertain. So the 
correct way to characterize our knowledge is always in terms of probabilities and the way to manipulate uh, probabilities, the way to get at the probabilities we're interested in is to use Bayesian inference. So Bayesian inference is just common sense uh, reduced to mathematics or um, I, I have to get the quote right. Let me go back. Um, Pierre Simon Laplace said this. Probability theory is nothing but common sense reduced to calculation. So that's and probability theory and um, Bayesian inference are basically the same thing. Well, one is an immediate consequence of the other. Good. So how does this work in um, neuroimaging, which we're interested in today? So we have a so-called forward problem. And that is not much of, or it is a problem. But basically, we have a model of how brain states are reflected in measurement. So these can be MRI measurements, they can be electrophysiological measurements, whatever. Basically, we have a measurement Y given a certain state of the system that we're investigating here, the brain. So the state of the brain theta leads to a certain probabilistic distribution of uh, observations that we expect under our so-called forward model. But of course, when we do an experiment, the observation Y is all we have. So what we're really interested in is the state of the brain given our observation Y. So we're interested in the probability of theta given Y. And that is where Bayesian inference comes in. So Bayesian inference tells us how we get from our forward model and our observation Y to the quantity of interest, which is the current state of the brain. So we have a generative model that goes from brain to measurement. We turn this around using Bayes' theorem and we get back from the measurement to the brain state. So, turning from the brain again to Bayesian inference in general, let's look at a practical example. And let's also contrast the way things are done in classical statistics and the way things are done in Bayesian inference. And let's see some of the pitfalls that uh, Bayesian inference avoids um, that um, can appear when you blindly do apply uh, when you blindly do classical statistics and apply the rules that are um, taught there. So let's say you work for a company and the boss says we have to decide whether to buy uh, certain parts from manufacturer A or B. And of course, the parts from manufacturer B are a bit more expensive than the ones from uh, manufacturer A. But um, perhaps if they live longer, it turns out to be cheaper to buy, buy from B in the long run. So we buy some parts from A and some parts from B and we observe their lifetime. So on the left, you have the lifetimes of the parts from A and the lifetimes of the parts from B on the right. From which manufacturer would you guys buy? Anyone? No answer in the chat. Oh, I can see now that I turned to the chat, someone had the right um, answer to the conditional probability question first there. So that's great, Flavia. So all the answers that I get are B. Good, let's work with that. Let's see whether that makes sense. How do we compare such samples? Well, that's usually my next question. And um, since this is an online presentation, I'll just um, give you the most common answer myself by comparing their arithmetic means. So we just um, sum them up and divide them by the number of numbers. 
and then we get the mean and then we say oh this sample has a higher mean than the other sample and so on so why do we take means it seems like a lazy thing to do at first perhaps but uh, there are actually deep reasons why it's a good thing to do so if we take the mean as our estimate the error in our estimate is the mean of the errors in the individual measurement so um, that means um, the errors are going to cancel out at some point so that is a good thing to do and taking the mean as a maximum likelihood estimate implies a gaussian error distribution so that is how the gaussian distribution was found originally by gauss uh, because he wanted to understand what are we actually doing when we're taking a mean what is the implied probability distribution of the errors in taking the mean um turns out it is the Gaussian distribution and that's why uh, because he found that it was named after him so a Gaussian error distribution appropriately reflects our prior knowledge about the errors whenever we know nothing about them except um perhaps their variance so, so if we know oh um our quantity is going to have a certain location and the errors are going to have a certain variance um then making a Gaussian assumption about the errors is the appropriate thing to do it's a sort of the um, most conservative thing to do um, we are making the fewest assumptions in assuming Gaussian errors um, so we're not introducing any knowledge we actually don't have and um, this as I already mentioned is what is implied in taking the mean so taking the mean is a good idea except if you have more information that tells you you should do something else so if you know nothing um, more than your quantity has some kind of location and some kind of variance then um, that uh, is the thing to do so let's pretend we're classical statisticians how do we compare the means of two samples well we'll do a t-test right that's what we all learned in our statistics undergraduate courses um but first we have to consider um, that there are different kinds of t-tests there are equal variance t-tests and um, unequal variance t-tests so we have to find out which t-test to do uh so we compare the variances doing an f-test so we compare these variances and we see that the p-value is 0.33 about so the variances are not significantly different so we may not assume that they are different so we do an equal variance t-test the means are not significantly different so from this classical procedure here I could accuse those who opted for manufacture b of being unscientific so this scientific procedure here showed us that um, there is no difference between the means so we may not pretend um, that the manufacturers from uh, the path from manufacturer b live longer than the path from manufacturer a even though your common sense told you so but now if you go back to your boss with this and say oh we can't say anything on the basis of these samples then um your boss is going to throw that result back at your face and say this is useless because I can look at these numbers and I know manufacturer B is better so this is not really satisfactory actually we can apply probability theory to this problem and say what is the probability that the path from manufacturer B lived so and so much longer than the path from manufacturer A on the basis of the data that we have so let's try and do that so this is a procedure that is always the same and goes through a few steps that I'll mention a first time here and then a second time later you first determine your question of interest what is the probability that you want to determine then you specify your model and that's a, a likelihood and a prior as we saw before you calculate the posterior using Bayes theorem you ask your question of interest of the posterior for instance what is the probability that the paths from B live longer than paths from A and so on 
And all you need to do now is the rules of probability theory. You will, of course, face technical difficulties. Um, it's not always simple to apply the rules of probability theory. Um, there are sometimes integrals that you cannot solve analytically. But in these days, we have software that solves all of these problems mostly. As long as you have enough information in your data, you will be able to answer these probabilistic questions. So let's do the first step. Let's formulate our question properly. What is the probability that the components from manufacturer B have a longer lifetime than those from manufacturer A? Now, we can be even more specific. We can define a decision rule. We can say, given how much more expensive they are, how much longer do I require the components from B to live? And the decision rule that we will use here as an example is if the components from B live three hours longer than those from A with a probability of at least 80%, I will choose from B. The reason that I require them to live longer is because they are slightly more expensive. So, but if they live three hours longer with a probability of at least 80%, I will go with the more expensive parts from B. Now, let's apply probability theory to find out whether this is the case. So the model, we choose a Gaussian likelihood. Never mind the equation here. It's, um, yeah, um, you don't have to understand the details here. I'm just informing you we are choosing a Gaussian likelihood. And we are choosing a Gaussian gamma prior. And the fortunate thing here is you don't have to do um, these calculations they have been done before you can basically look up the result and the software does this for you you can also solve this problem using your favorite um, sampler um, something like stan or turing if you're using julia um, pi mc3 and so on many solutions so the joint posterior distributions of lifetimes mu a for the parts from manufacturer a and mu b from the parts from manufacturer b respectively can be calculated here and now we can use these posterior distributions to answer our question what is the probability that parts from b live at least three hours longer than the parts from a so formulated probabilistically, this is what is the probability that the mean lifetime of B minus the mean lifetime of A is greater than three? Now we can do this integral. And again, if you have uh, determined these posterior probabilities using sampler, it's very easy to ma manipulate these samples in a way to give you the answer. And it turns out that there is a 0.9501 probability that the parts from B live three hours longer than the parts from A. Now, let me emphasize that this 0.95 has nothing to do with a classical um, p-value threshold um, uh, of 0.05 or anything because our decision rule said 0.8. So we would go with the parts from manufacturer B if this number is 0.8 or greater and turns out to be 0.95. And it also turns out that your common sense did not mislead you. Your common sense was actually right. All of those who answered, I would go with the parts from B. So here mathematics backs you up. The important thing to note here is that the t-test told us there was no significant difference between the two means in the two samples, even though according to our Bayesian calculation, there is a greater than 95% probability that the parts from B will last at least three hours longer than those from A. So this is where dichotomizing your um, paths in the decision tree, where you first make a decision, um, shall I do this kind of t-test? Shall I do that kind of t-test? Um, and then you have a second dichotomy between 
significant difference of the means and not significant difference of the means. If you have a succession of such um, forks in your decision path, you can get to a very wrong place. So a superior way of doing this is to keep the uncertainty at each step. So in the end, we ended up with two posterior probability distributions for the two lifetimes from the two manufacturers. So we kept all the uncertainty until the very end. And then on the basis of all the uncertainty that we propagated through to the end, we made a decision. So um, we used probability theory to quantify our knowledge. And on the basis of that whole knowledge, we were able to make a rational decision. And that is also what we want to do when we analyze neuroimaging data. So again, the procedure in brief, determine your question of interest, specify your model, ask your question of interest of the posterior after propagating all the uncertainty down to the end. And all you need is the rules of probability theory. So one slide quickly juxtaposing these two um, approaches that I've mentioned. The classical approach is to formulate a null hypothesis and then look at how far your observation is from uh, the expected outcome under the null hypothesis. And if it's sufficiently unlikely, then you reject the null hypothesis. But of course, there is not a unique null hypothesis that you um, can test. Um, so you, 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 have, you often have some, kind of, some latitude in choosing what your null hypothesis is going to be. And you can influence the probability that will be rejected just by um, choosing it in one way or another. So um, in Beige, the Bayesian approach, uh, by contrast, um, builds a model of the situation you're investigating and looks at the posterior distribution of your quantity of interest. And then you, um, if you have to take a binary decision in the end, um, then you, take, you can take that decision on the basis of um, the probability mass exceeding a certain threshold or, or how much of the probability mass exceeds a certain threshold in the end. So in our case, um, our threshold was at three hours and 95% of the probability mass was above that threshold. So we took the decision in one way or another. So it's a it's a basically a very different approach. Now, having said all this and having um, emphasized the sort of theoretical superiority of uh, probabilistic approach on the right, um, I have to say that if you do classical inference the right way. So if you think enough about each of the steps along the way that you do, you can also solve all the problems that um, Bayesian inference solves for you in classical ways. So um, classical statistics done right can be a good tool and can um, give you the probabilistically correct answer in the end, which is going to be the same way, uh, the same answer as uh, Bayesian statistics would have given you, given you. But there are more ways to get it wrong doing classical statistics. You need to know um, sort of more tricks and more procedures and so on. It's not a framework from first principles. It is to a large extent, a bag of tricks, and you have to know the right tricks in order to get it right. So there are far more pitfalls on the classical statistics side. And classical statistics is in some ways also a misleading name because it's younger than Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics, statistics was, um, even though it's called Bayesian, and that's from the 18, uh, from the 1760s, I think, um, it was really introduced by Laplace around 1800, whereas classical statistics came in vogue in the 1920s and 1930s. So in some sense, um, inference was done right before uh, the sort of dangerous uh, procedures from classical statistics came in vogue uh, 
and now the pendulum has swung back a little and um, there's also been a great reconciliation of uh, the approaches so 20 30 years ago there was still um, a kind of uh, war going on in statistics between classical and bayesian approaches and because people have realized that you can answer questions both ways correctly um, this is much less acrimonious today so let us talk a little bit about um, model evidence and odds so the base rule in the formulation for odds looks like this now the odds is a probability ratio so probability of a relates to the odds of a in that the odds of a are the probability of a divided by the probability of not a so the odds of it raining is the probability that it um, rains divided by the probability that it doesn't rain so let's say if the probability is one half then we would end up with one half divided by one half so the odds um, when the probability is one half are one and so on and of course the transformation can be done the other way around from odds to probability and this is just algebra the bookmakers offer odds against events for example odds of three to one on a horse imply a probability of 0 0.75 so it's the probability for the horse not to win Um, and that's just important to remember if you go to the bookmakers. Um, so in terms of odds, you can reformulate Bayes' rule in this manner. Again, uh, never mind the algebra. Um, the important thing to understand is simply that you can go from prior odds to posterior odds by multiplying by the likelihood ratio. The likelihood ratio is the probability of observing, of making the observation y given that your hypothesis h is true divided by making the observation y given that your hypothesis is not true and this likelihood ratio is sometimes called the base factor and this is because multiplying the prior odds with this factor gives you the posterior odds and the powerful thing here is that my prior odds can be different from your prior odds you may be biased towards or against hypothesis H in a different way that I am. And um, so we have different prior odds and therefore we also have different posterior odds. But the factor by which we multiply our prior odds to get our posterior odds is the same for you and for me, regardless of whether one of us is more biased in one direction or the other. So the Bayes factor is a measure for how much making observation Y favors hypothesis H over hypothesis H bar. And this is used in model comparison. The fact that the Bayes factor is a measure of strength of evidence can be used for model comparison. So if we consider hypothesis, hypotheses H0 and H1, then Bayes rule for the odds of h1 over h0 is this the probability of h1 given our observations y divided by the probability of h0 given observation y and here we have the likelihood ratio again and here the prior odds so the likelihood ratio is the ratio of marginal likelihoods also called the model evidence and in terms of log model evidence the log base factor is simply the difference so if we take the log of the base factor here then this um, this fraction can be written as a difference and then we have the mod the log model evidence of hypothesis one minus the log model evidence of hypothesis zero and you will see that a lot um, in um, comparing models dcm models and spm and so on so here is 
just for your reference, if you ever wonder about how all of this works, the algebra that gives you this. I'll just um, put this up on this slide. You can go back to this if you ever wonder about the algebra behind it all. An important point to note is that you can decompose the negative variational free energy, often loosely just uh, referred to as free energy. So it's just people are saying, ooh, free energy, free energy, um, here and there and so on. Um, and the precise meaning of uh, that quantity is often the negative variational free energy. So the negative variational free energy can be decomposed into accuracy minus complexity. So it has a, an accuracy term and a complexity term. So a few um, remarks on model comparison and its, its practical application. There's a range of scores that help in choosing a well-performing model. So and many of you will have heard of the AIC, the Akaiki Information Criterion, the, the BIC, Bayesian Information Criterion. There are Bayes factors, there's local model evidence, there's free energy, and so on. So in these approaches, each model gets a particular score, which on its own is uninterpretable. So the number itself doesn't tell you anything. It's always only the difference in score between different models that uh, which counts, which tells you something. So even with these tools, with AIC, BIC, and so on, model selection is not straightforward. Um, AIC and BIC are approximations to the log model evidence, and they penalize complexity based on a simple on, on simple heuristics. And that may not reflect complexity as accurately as log model evidence um, or the negative variational free energy that we saw on the previous slide. Log model evidence is better on that count, but it is also very sensitive to the modeler's choice of priors. So if you go and play around with your priors, you will get different log model evidences, and that gives you an opportunity to gain the outcome of your model comparison. So. Um, if you want to, um, if you attach lots of importance to the outcome of a model comparison, I would recommend looking in detail at the assumptions going into the model comparison there. The three decisive considerations when comparing models um, are, number one, the, that's the most basic one, does the model allow me to answer my question of interest? It seems... Um, yeah, strange to state this explicitly, but um, you will in practice encounter situations where someone says, oh, why didn't you apply model X to the data? Because it fits the data much better than the model you've used. But of course, that doesn't help you if model X that fits the data much better doesn't answer your scientific question. So, so you have a model because you have a scientific question um, and you shouldn't lose sight of that. Now. How do you find a good prior distribution? That is a question that you get a lot, that we get all the time in applying Bayesian inference. So, so how do we find a good prior distribution to use? And the answer to that is you simulate from your model, you run it forward before fitting the data. And that gives you the prior predictive distribution. And you want that prior predictive distribution to cover all plausible observations, all observations that from your background knowledge of the field that you have make sense. And you do not want your prior predictive distribution to be wider than that. You do not want it to include absurd behaviors, absurd measurements, impossible um, values. So people often have uh, misgivings about choosing priors that are sufficiently tight because they're afraid of biasing their results. But actually, the conservative choice is often a tighter prior 
because that restricts your prior predictive distribution to values that make sense. Number three, does the posterior predictive distribution of observations make sense? So after fitting your data, you repeat the exercise of simulating from your model. So now you take the posterior distributions of the parameters in your model that you have from the data, and you go back and you simulate data, artificial data, on the basis of the um, uh, fits that you have from your actual data. And then you should find the same patterns as in the actual data. And that is an indication that you've got a good model. So rather than um, knocking yourself out on formal model comparison criteria like AIC and BIC and so on, if you can say yes to all three questions down there, does the model allow me to answer my scientific question of interest? Does the prior predictive distribution make sense? Does the posterior predictive distribution make sense and um, reproduce the pattern seen in the actual data? If you can say yes to that, um, you can be satisfied that you have a good model. A few notes on uninformative priors. I've basically already said this. Um, general advice is choose your priors tightly enough for your prior predictive simulations only to cover outcomes that make sense. So um, uninformative priors or too loose priors, too flat priors, often um, give you a prior predictive um, that is too wide, that includes impossible observations, and that makes you vulnerable to overfitting as you fit your model. And then just a quick run through of um, applications of Bayesian inference in neuroimaging. So we use this for statistical inference, posterior probability maps are Bayesian uh, posteriors. Segmentation and normalization wouldn't work without the regularization offered by um, Bayesian priors. So this depends crucially on Bayesian inference, dynamic causal modeling, um, depends on Bayesian inference um, for model comparison and for inference. Multivariate decoding. Um, again, the example of segmentation here um, wouldn't work, would be impossible if it weren't constrained by priors. Um, fMRI time series analysis depends on Bayesian inference. As mentioned, dynamic causal modeling and model comparison for group studies is enabled by um, Bayesian inference. And that is all I have. Thank you.